Hello everyone, today we talk about Swiss tactics and organization. It seems almost incredible that uh, for a channel based on medieval warfare we never actually talked about the Swiss in a dedicated video, yet we talked about the Friede and the Confederates um, and you know the, the, the qualities if you want that the Swiss owned and for, for achieving what they did in that specific historical context. We will make another video about that as we will make um, lots of videos not just about all the battles involving the Swiss and well you know of course their opponents for that matter um, but also videos about the Swiss guards and better ones about tactics specifically and the same organization and so on. So this is just the beginning. So today I would like just to address <coughs> the, the issue in general concentrating specifically on on renaissance warfare like not talking about the the medieval swiss or at least you know we, you can argue that the, the swiss military organization from the mid 15th century is what actually made uh, modern warfare in a sense this is uh, perhaps also slightly um, untrue right and surely debatable uh, modern warfare was born fundamentally with with the full integration of pike and shot during uh, with the battle of Cerignola from you know, from by by the Spanish, um, with uh, Gonzalo de Cordoba, which is without any shadow of a doubt the, the greatest commander there in 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 modern history. People don't even care even about this kind of ranking and, and the reasons why. The Swiss, however, there is no doubt they opened the path to to that system. Yet they weren't born, you know, the day before. Um, I, as you know, I specialize in early 14th century warfare, so. Um, and especially in the you know the infantry tactics at the time, so the Swiss with Morgart and especially later on with Laupen, um, I think about Zempach, all these you know important engagements throughout the 14th century make them a, a bit mm, of an exception. The Swiss are an exception also during the 14th century, but not for for their quality, rather for their continuity, right? Their quality emerges and reigns, I'd say, from from the mid 15th century. And um, Marignano could could be the uh, you know the, the ending limit, which was as you know uh, an important Swiss defeat. It kind of marks the, their their sunset from from terms of military preeminence, but it was also mm, a lucky uh, blow for the political and social implication in in uh, Swiss history, as um, their their victory in that occasion would have triggered certain characters that would have probably denaturated the Confederacy. For what have, would have become through the also the interreligious struggles, and um, let's say their, the autonomy that Swiss maintained is the bar center within itself. This is all <coughs> a background I realize we should introduce in other videos, but let's say, in fact, we will leave it for for another time. It's just important to um, to remember it because it's that none of this makes sense without a context. Right, and in the video about the Swiss qualities, we will surely list what made, in a sense, the Swiss the Swiss as we we know them in Renaissance warfare. And today we stop roughly to the mid 17th century, not even. Just talking a little bit about what, quite essentially, Swiss tactics and organization were about. So, um, a bit of prehistory is important as well because again the the medieval developments are also important essentially the Swiss started with their essentially eight foot halberds right and initially was the Vosges um, then eventually evolving the most the more sophisticated halberd that was a hell of a can opener let's say contrary wise to what is commonly believed or at least shouldn't I don't know how commonly people even think about these things, but halberds are actually not effective anti-cavalry weapons at all, right? Pikes are the only effectively anti-cavalry weapons in combination with other, uh, with missiles, etc. And uh, as all, um, uh, let's say, early 14th century infantries, actually, there wasn't much of a sophistication at that point. The Swiss... Mm, are the ones that continue in that wake in the sense that they are, as you know, we, we talk about the Swiss state, Switzerland was not really a state, and part of the reason of, of its strength laid exactly in in that cantonal political cohesion were certain uh, important aspects that, that had brought the Swiss 
to <clears throat> to continue even even their isolation in part but uh, also and especially of course their in fact their cohesion and national uh, cohesion the way they built it the way they they scored all this it was a long process a gradual one of marked by these important political negotiations and military successes and not just success in fact it should it, it's worth notice that uh, noticing that the the actual rise of the Swiss as a military uh, might right in the mid 15th century was the consequence of a bitter defeat against uh, the Milanese of Carmagnola that uh, essentially uh, dismounted right and as um, knights they they had longer weapons literally lances than than the Swiss halberds and massacred on foot that you know the Swiss at that point and this was such a uh, you know, a, a meaningful, uh, you know, evidence that also makes us make you makes you probably realize what I what I mean when I say that uh, the, the 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 rise of infantry is from the 14th to 15th century was not a linear process at all, and that there had been a refeudalization during the second half of the 14th. It brings this Swiss reasoning in their in their in, in their valleys to decide to extend the proportion of pikes over infant uh, over halberds that will take a while right it wasn't even there from for a day to another but that required as you know a much greater um, cost a, a much greater collective training because pikes essentially are effective only if you have lots of pikemen um, and um, in such formations as such arrays should be intensely trained right to maintain the proper cohesion, not to make this this wall break, and to maximize, the, in fact, the collective effort of this of these weapons that are also pretty long, um, require, in fact, that for that reason, much higher training than, than other. Independently from, as we will see now, the relatively you know unrefined tack, the you know fence that that the pike entailed, right? These things had not a let or things like that, um, but they were at that point something that Europe per se had not quite seen. That is to say. An infantry with with a with with an aggressive capacity. That is to say, infantry had always at some point, of course, advanced and attacked. But they they up to that point they had done it either with disastrous results, um, and uh, the fl the Flemish teach in this sense, and or in support of cavalry, right? So and and not quite as um you know decisive because they they lacked the the, the training. And the to to maintain uh, um, uh, um, uh, the front the front cohesion while advancing in that fashion. So much more intra intense training from a country that in was quite politically cohesive to you know put in common the, the resources and demand like literally from a demographic point of view in order to create what we know as the 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 very large sometimes you know up to six thousand um and and more with with, with the other um uh, and maybe in the same army pike squares uh, as we know them and then how they, they would have essentially been imitated by the rest of the, of the westerners starting from the the Landsknechten of maximilian of Habsburg, and then eventually you know the, the spanish bring, bring that back to up to the mid 17th century as the the, the top um quality troops um, but there is a graduality in the Swiss experiment as we were saying before but properly from a chronological point of view right the initial halberds were something like eight foot long right um, the the halberd in this sense was an effective weapon at close range especially against armor there, there's in, instance if I'm not wrong at Morgart and properly you know this um, halberds literally at least the source, the chronicles say, cutting through armor, quite, um, quite not like butter, but properly stressing the cutting capacity, which is, you know, n n probably, you know, an exaggeration in some ways, but surely that was the effect, was the idea of taking down uh, individually the, the the armored opponents and kind of breaking through armor with this ferocious strength and, you know, also cutting you know the, the the horses hooves and all these things um, and that could happen um, when naturally the infantry could have you know come to 
uh, uh, grips w with uh, grips with with cavalry went while stopped went while essentially exposed, which was not the normality in open ground, right? And the Swiss were helped in this early battles against the Habsburgs essentially by the terrain, right, or, and or strategic decisions such as you know ambushing the enemy before they could form him up in battle line and so on. So that's what would favor actually. Um, these these events and not much actually this the Swiss quality per se right the achievement for for example the, the Flemish infantry in defensive function at Courtrai or um, other even the Scots during the, the wars of independence I mean there are many instances of you know of, of, of infantry that properly faced cavalry in open field and, and managed to crush it right the Swiss in the early period especially in the first half of the 14th century old um, more to the terrain uh, and the strategical contingencies, ambushes and so on, their, their triumphs, so that we cannot quite measure in the same way uh, their success like in one of other peoples. And Switzerland was also a peculiar um, land in itself, uh, you know, always think in the sense that there were mountains, right, but they had an important wealth, especially for trade, um, that was in this sense the combination between, let's say, a mountaineer people that, that hadn't up to that point had a particular development in Europe but still um, had uh, benefited a lot from the privatization of the German kingdom the the uh, the prerogatives given over the Sumpernard Pass with the new bridges with the um, and the new ways uh, also granted by Frederick the uh, second etc to secure the Alpine passes and so they had developed as an hybrid because it had an important trade uh, income from, from the position on the Alpine passes and still this war likeness and you know cohesion of various cantons that had emerged in the struggle for, for autonomy within uh, the uh, you know uh, the, the German kingdom against you know uh, specifically the Habsburgs but expanding their own control through the Friede uh, the, the you know and the, the in fact the Landfried was exactly the, the institutional trick to which they actually were trying to pacify to, to still play by the rules right and within within the kingdom right eventually this has been read nationally in the, in the struggle for independence but actually was not quite of a, a secessionistic thing at all it's just that uh, there was a very peculiar combination of, of, of factors that allowed this uh, the system to to expand right and consolidate on very different bases by the way from many other one in Europe, and uh, there are some exceptions of this, like the, the Dutch in the you know from the mid uh, 17th century, or the Libyans in the Bronze Age. You know, populations that didn't really have too too many resources, there, but were able to seize and consolidate um, you know wealth and power that um, was eventually to to make history, quite literally, um, and the eventually. So pikes existed, of course, uh, because every mm, this is the sometimes that, 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 that I get. It's a matter of proportions, right? Um, weapons such as pikes had always been there, right? Also in the Middle Ages, but it was not a moment in which pikes emerge, if not as the and the uh, consistent or or even prevalent towards the in fact the, the 1500s, um, uh, the um, weapon among infantry that, as we were saying before, requires this greater level of training, right? Pikes were employed just by the first ranks, then the other are equipped with these traumatic weapons, etc. The important to stop cavalry, right? And you do need that frontal cohesion and, and exclusively a pike at that point, also because these people, such as, you know, the Swiss or, or the Flemish, didn't quite make mm, particular, I mean, substantial employment of the missile troops, Right, which is remarkable if you consider what the Swiss achieved, especially in, in the second half of the 15th century, where not only other, you know, uh, you know, other countries made, you know, important use of missile troops, but also firearms had become at that point artillery included, uh, which the Swiss never quite had in important numbers and actually suffered from. At some point, Marignano is, is the example here. Um, for not having developed, but that's in fact not the point, it's not technology, it's, it's about this, in fact, uh, human force, right, of pikes that eventually manages to advance and overwhelm everything they, they found uh, in the front. Th this process, as we were saying before, takes time, it passes importantly and crucially through the defeat of Arbedo in 1422, uh, and the increase of, of pikes had um, 
already occurred in a sense. They originally, they, also they're, they're, they're length increased importantly. They originally were something like 10 foot long. Eventually they were enlarged to 18 in the early, um, in the early phase of the Italian wars. Uh, so this naturally reflects the process of professionalization that had also occurred over time. Also, you know, some, some um, necessity fitting the, 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 the standards of other countries that were, that were fighting against that were starting to use bikes on their own. And, and so there was a competition uh, in the process. Uh, at that point, Switzerland, as you know, had functionalized itself in providing uh, with, with that specific political legitimization from, from their own institutions, these uh, armies on rent, right, to other, other countries, mostly France, not only. Um, the more this went on, let's say, uh, the more the Swiss actually began to um, to also appear as private mercenaries here and there, because naturally they could, you know, could really stop anybody to, to for example, remaining in, in service in, in some other land. And the, the advantage of the Swiss in this sense, especially with France, we, we, we made that video on the um, on French, uh, native French infantry, right, during the, the 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 renaissance and the efforts france made to th and uh, the great advantage of of the swiss was not just the fact that they were professionals skilled in their job but that they would come back to switzerland once once the the, the uh, you know the contract the the, the 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 service was over right so they, they wouldn't represent let's say a dangerous popular uh, element of veterans that could take uh, unmass arms in you know in hands to to subvert the, the the political order in France that as you know is a pretty turmoilous you know giant right demographically speaking and you know I think the, from the Jacquerie to the wars of religion to 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 the French Revolution that the Fronde etc has been quite evident and beyond by the way historically. Um, so, uh, but it, it it is obvious that you know we're talking about 16th century Europe. There aren't really you know borders or capacities of coercion in the way we we are habituated to contemporarily. Um, so of course some of these men would also offer their service uh, autonomously outside, and the the the, um, the the pikes were a bit the, the sap of this because from the, in the mid. 15th century, we will see the proportion was one to one to, to helpers fundamentally. So, and and especially in the front where uh, they had the not just a defensive function now, but also an offensive one, right? So the idea of the mass, the concentration of the pikes, and the training necessary to maintain cohesion while advancing that had basically in medieval times had never quite been seen, right? In in properly in function of attack, right? Infantry knew how to advance to maneuver. Um, they're quite uh, overlooked in this sense. In medieval warfare, they did, right? The important was to, to meet the foe, though, and on, on, on let's say, with, with, a, with odds that could be favorable, so with an aggressive uh, capacity of infantry, that up to that point, before the Swiss, uh, had never quite existed as such, right? One thing is, you know, again, overwhelming an enemy that still has to pass from column to, to line formation, another thing, you know, ambushing him, or you know, taking him by surprise in, in other ways. Another thing is literally having to attack cavalry from it, which you know, at, at that point, infantry had been able to, uh, let's say, that hadn't never been able to achieve. Right? They 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 had been able from the beginning of the 14th century, essentially, to 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 take to to defeat them d defensively. Right? But whenever they passed to the counterattack, normally they. They had quite of a of a problem unless the enemy was completely broken right at that point. But even the lack of cavalry, importantly, in these armies, sometimes rendered things much easier for the enemy. They could even reform and reattack them when they had abandoned positions. So, but this the, it, it, this is the importance of the Swiss, and and it is um, you know so the Swiss military model is deeply different um, between the you know the the, the 15th and the 14th century. They're literally very two important things. I, I detest when. You know, in, on various documentaries, they, they, they present the Swiss as a, as a sort of monad that never changed, or that, you know, where there is not this deep difference, or people think that there weren't other peoples or infantries or capacities that, you know, uh, at some point, and to contextualize them proportionally, dimensionally, in this picture. This is the big deal of the Swiss, and that's how they made the thing.
right? It's not even about the fact that they were mercenaries. Yes, they, they were kind of professional in nature, and that's what exactly what the, the deal was there always. It's about training, it's about the moral force, it's about the motivation, the cohesion, the profit, right? The profit um, as, in fact, as, as soldiers, but soldiers had kind of always existed in that sense, and they wouldn't be then, nor the first, nor the last. Um, and the pike uh, so was functionally uh, was functional to, to the attack here. So um, characteristically, at least not always, because there are also certain theories according to which some people used the held the, the pikes in, in a certain way, some in others. Things were probably more homogeneous than we think. But at least for this, was the the pike was characteristically held head high, well forward from, from forward from the butt, right, and with the point inclined down. Right, so this was true, especially for the the, the you know the ranks before the, the first one. Normally, it was like four or five ranks. Um, the first one tendentially held the pike much more in the middle, right? Which, from one side, um, of course, exposed the pikemen to to the enemy more because the the whole point of the pike, uh, you know, is is in itself as in polarity, is to keep the, to 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 offend the enemy while you're you're at distance right from him right and that's the whole deals of, of of troops that are not really meant in fact into to engage into hand-to-hand -hand combat um with the same for example the degree of skill or capacity of i don't know of a knight at that point as you know the spikes sometimes were you know this pike walls were, were kind of uh, broken through by some suicide um troops uh, like equipped with double hand swords that were paid even more just for this kind of task etc uh, to open gaps in the other information but concretely the as we were saying before the what made the pikes effective was the the collective employment and the mass all of it and so it was relatively unrefined but still there were some things you could do in the in the front rank you would sacrifice normally this um, this reach but for being kind of more scientific in employment of your pike, right? In that sense, um, if you hold it in, 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 in the middle, you decrease very much the, the, the oscillations that happen when you uh, hold it mostly from the butt, because as we've seen, it's very, very long. And, um, and you can't quite control it so much. So at that point, you can also make a bit of pairing. As we were saying before, there, there, is, there are no elet there. there. There doesn't seem to be any refined fencing with, with pike. Uh, having been employed in mass was something savage, right? And also disorder you can imagine in, in the first ranks, but still, um, it was about the push. This this the idea of literally the advance and the capacity of the the posterior ranks to push forward, like a phalanx. That's what technically uh, the thing was. Uh, albeit very different also from the front one of the past. Don't make too many every time you see you know pikes or you know formation like that. Say ah, oh, it's the phalanx. It's all the same. It's all the same. Type. No, it, it, these are very different contexts and. Um, there are so solutions that are essentially, you know, the, the same, but that when con in fact contextualizing what how they were used makes you understand the differences, how they were, and um, yeah, and, and the objective was naturally to injure the the uh, the the foe, and or if you really didn't make it for you know trying to make him lose balance by literally poking him maybe on the armor etc. and pressing this important force. Um, so throughout our period, the Swiss remained pikemen in nature. This is kind of the uh, the nature of Swiss armies, right? And as such, uh, they, as you understand, they had relatively limited capacities, tactically speaking, because they uh, they couldn't make much use of combined arms. As we will see, yes, the, they they had cavalry, they had missile troops, they had artillery, but you know, inconsistent, less numbers often than the enemy, not always, but still important because the, the core of the Swiss army was about the pikemen. These contingents were employed uh, in within other armies, right? So they, they, they would have been employed as infantry, right? By powers like France that had, for example, very strong cavalry, very strong artillery, but they sucked at infantry. So they were integrated in a combined armed system, uh, albeit maintaining always this, this, mm, Primate, this, this, the, the of of quality over other infantries for a long time to throughout 
you know, most of it, the mid 15th and the beginning of the 16th century before they were fundamentally surpassed. In fact, exactly by combined armed tactics, because still the Swiss kept, even within other armies, kept kind of operating their own way, right? That's what the infantry had to do after all. They finally they had, they had found a way of having an offensive infantry that could uh, invest all what the enemy uh, could could put forward. And of course, as the superiority of combined arms and collective training teaches us, of course, the, the, least, the, the greater the collective effectiveness and, and the least the need of the individual effectiveness, right? For example, most Swiss were without armor, right? Uh, front rank men naturally were well protected, um, normally with open burgonet or pot helmet, right? Um, half or three quarter armor, and, and often arm protection, including male sleeves, and this was mostly uh, because, of course, of all the uh, also the missile um, uh, fire that were exposed to those points. So of course, the front ranks were, and also just mostly the enemy, the enemy, uh, you know, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat offensive capabilities, right? But this is exactly the point. The fact that just the front ranks were fundamentally heavily armored, and the rest not so much tells you how much the Swiss formation rela relied on just the collective pressure, right? The idea is that the, 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 the fight wouldn't last that long for the enemy to resist this human tide, and therefore it was kind of useless in cost-benefit ratio to equip all the rest of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the army, and so mostly infantrymen. So a lot lots of people, by the way, with heavier equipment, right? The same, this is not much because of you know, people say, oh, it's because, you know, firearms rendered useless. N not really, right? The reason why, uh, you know, armor was abandoned eventually in with the rise of firearms is not much the fact that uh, there couldn't be, uh, it, it's not a, 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 a directly proportional, let's say, dynamic to the fact that, that armor couldn't stop bullets. That they had armors that could s stop bullets. The fact is that they cost too much. And at a, a certain point, historically, they became just too, even too heavy, too cumbersome, etc. So it would have, if, at, at that point, um, it wasn't about saying, you know, at this point, uh, you know, uh, any armor will be rendered useless by, 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 by firearms because it will be, you know, just passed through. No, it wasn't about passing through. It, that also took a, a long time before it actually happened uh in in absolute terms that was about the the actual cost that the equipment of of, of certain amount of troops would have had in heavier in every equipment right the 15th century had been the the triumph in a sense of of armor it's the the, the greater the moment of in which most troops are armored on on western battlefields right because uh, firearms yes they're, they are there and that's part of the reason why also you use armor at that point but not quite to the point of rendering in fact all that that the protection useless there was kind of a greater professionalization at some level so uh, these troops were you know relatively you know they were equipped by by powers that could afford certain expenses but also in a contained fashion to that specific troop so um that would in fact take away kind of the lower classes from the exercise of warfare at least in that specific uh, professional form uh, of heavily armored troopers um and instead, the, the, the Swiss opened, reopened the you know, Renaissance warfare to this uh, cooptation of the, you know, the poorest elements of society from, eventually, they weren't a principality, as you know, but the, all the other powers would develop, um, pike squares and so on, were, right, so that there isn't a rise of infantry per se, because, you know, the lowest classes were richer and more powerful. Absolutely not. It's completely the contrary. Now, these were all proletarians, you know, hired because they, they were literally the scum of society, as 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 soldiers, because you know, even that that life was kind of less risky or like you know more appealable in general than just the one they would have in civilian life, uh, whatever at that point it meant for them, um, and they were be hired in mass by the big powers of Europe, right? They had the money, the land, the power, and all these stuff, and and so that's Renaissance warfare as we know, it. we know it, and uh, not just that, right? Historical, but um, so. They, the Swiss would present themselves as, as a deep pike phalanx, um, with the usual halberdiers guarding the collars, um, and being used if the the advance was was halted, right. So when, 
you know, that there was a possibility to employ by, by essentially pinning down the enemy and kind of managing to approach, right, uh, against even troops that, let's remember, it were not all equipped with, with pikes, right, you know, if you could send halberdiers in, they could have an effect also with armored troops and so on. Um, there was some proportion of missile troops, not completely relevant, but still like, like, one out of ten, right, with the with, uh, crossbows, from the 90s of the f f 15th century onwards, with arquebuses, right, at that point, and their function was marginal, but still tactically kind of useful, like forming skirmishing screens in front, or on the flanks of the pikes, right, because at this point, uh, of course, as soon as the, the, the pike square is born, the you know the, the the military arts started toying with how to to combine that with with firearms at, at some point and so that's the broader process that will bring to 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 linear tactics in uh, in a couple of centuries uh, all but a revolution uh, as you can understand um, so when instead the Swiss had to fight on on their own literally as you know the, the Confederacy or part of it say that were also in, uh, in internal um, struggles, etc., uh, they they had naturally a larger proportion of other arms, other types of troops. For example, at the Battle of Morat in, in 1476, um, they had two cavalry to every fire, uh, five firearms, five pikes, and five halberds. Right. So it's it's interestingly combined. That also makes you understand how just the the model of, of the pikemen. Um, it's not um, uh, the, the pikemen alone. It's not really what the Saint Swiss would opt when they had the possibility to. So it's important not to steer. Morat was also a great victory, as you know. The they they um, this is part of the Burgundian Wars and this series, the disastrous series of defeat. Actually, one of the the most advanced uh, armies of the time, the Burgundian one, to get together with the Venetian Condotta was at, at the top. Of uh, the you know of military organization development, it's also kind of often misunderstood in importance, just because eventually they lost, right? The, the fact of, of losing is not entirely the the thing. You have kind of to understand why, right? Because you know if you think you can be a military star and just saying settling the matter, that thing to lose. So it's not important to understand how and why. You you will never quite understand also how balanced the odds were concretely. Right, we need to, as always, to radically extremize and stereotype things by saying, you know, those those sucked because they lost, or they, those were so special because they won. But it, at the time, it wasn't quite the same thing. Also, what the Swiss was doing was dramatically innovative, was really something that that was not expected, especially the speed on the battlefield of this infantry, and, and that had never been taken seriously in this sense because nobody had ever achieved that. Also, to have the eventual offensive capacity. Now they 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 showed that, but still they. Day as Swiss came from from a mentality that was of course um, about yes we have this arm we have developed for for certain for, for certain specific reasons we have because we have learned our lessons so on but yes you know if we have cavalry if we have infantry we have missile troops or still at that point um, halberdiers right you know we we should use them right and sometimes you can't even just um, you know doctrinally uh, decide. Uh, just the day before, uh, you know, what you can uh, make use of, right? So certain choices depend also on the political situation. You, you can't really change it more than much. So it's important to, to stress this aspect that certain things are more random than, than they actually see, right? Hence said this, still, the, 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 the Pike Infantry was really what made most of the, of the impact, right? Uh, when fighting... Uh, the French in the early 16th century they had one fourth of arquebusiers, a few cavalry, um, alpha of which mounted arquebusiers, or at that point, and a small number, uh, so four to eight of, of cannon. So, as you understand, the in, in this case, instead, there is a um, you know, there is a prevalence of infantry, right? And the 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 what puzzled, as we were saying before, the the enemies at that point in the European battlefields was was the 
the impossibility of really stopping uh, infantry so easily, right? Because you can always stop an enemy formation, but first of all, you, you must have mass order and especially speed, right? Let, let's also not overestimate just the the offensive capacity per se. I mean, the Swiss were, uh, you know, normal human beings like anybody, and it's not much about even just the push of the pikes in itself that made the thing. It's about the fact of literally, uh, like, in as battles are fundamentally won or lost over it's it's about how you 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 manage to combine um the interaction between the various lines right the various uh, chunks of your army on the battlefield if you think that the enemy is, is still you know kilometers away and instead uh, because you don't you don't think that infantry can can have that speed you you're going to be caught and prepared and at that point it's not even about what these troops can do in 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 hand-to-hand -hand combat it's it's literally the fact that they are arriving on you from i don't know from 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 the flank uh by surprise and you you don't have even the time to 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 counter-attack yourself in in a in an effective manner right so always remember this it's not much about what happens in the front line it, 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 it in, in the first rank it's it's about the literally how you you um you change all the game of the speed of the the, the major the the large units um, in interaction and dynamics on the battlefield that makes the difference here it's literally speed Th this this happened in many other times in history think about uh, the french columns during napoleonic times so about the same roman uh, manipulator legion i mean there was uh, an edge uh with all naturally all what what makes the, the, that is just the tip of the iceberg but that can't make the difference uh, decisively uh, if you if you take it singularly in, 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 a, in a again with odds that are definitely balanced because the enemy are not just there's not just a tactical formula is special per se or troops that are special per se it's about how you literally have that most of the times the degree of training collective training and professionalism that allows you to carry out maneuvers in a more speedy way than the enemy what do you think the Spartans for example were so effective Right, because they had were great individual fighters. That's actually not not the case, right? Maybe for Hellenic standards, yes, they were they were the only ones who were trained for that too. But that, that was not the point. The way the way they made it is just they they were dramatically faster and more cohesive than the enemy, and that's what makes the difference tactically wise, right? So uh, people today are obsessed about the, the uh, you know the, the individual skills. Right, that's why people bind to tribalism and international because they, they have to convince themselves that they're special just because they belong to a group without doing anything more um, rational or collectively uh, constructive that takes definitely the sap of a real superiority as a civilization. Um, this is exactly what happens in, in military history too, right? And so relying on individual superiority is a declaration of military inferiority, right? Because civilization crushed these models under their heels uh, uh, for exactly by, you know, exploiting the, this weakness of theirs. And, um, and of course, this was have their own, uh, their own primate at the time in European warfare. Um, so the pikes were normally formed into three very large columns. At Bicocca they were only two though. Uh, and in fact there is a, almost a stereotype um, about the Swiss always fighting with the Farhut, Gewalt, Alfen and the um, Nachhut as if that was kind of this, the, the echelon formation at least um, that was you know, sent one after the other as a court of oblique uh, order that actually happened only once in all Swiss military history as far as I know um, uh, by the way Nachut, Forhut, all these things are you know just normal like it, the rare guard of anger like they, they don't even tell you what they're going to do tactically speaking all the time because you can't combine these elements in, in a different way mostly it's this strong center like the, the Gewalthaufen that is the, the mass right at um, uh, at Novara, for example, in 1513, uh, there was a, a striking Swiss column of 6,000. Right? Consider, this thing had never quite been seen before in that way. 
plus two small diversionary ones of 1,000 and 2,000 respectively. Always remember, the, the numbers are not this huge deal. I mean, if you look at the early 14th century, you find even armies with tens of thousands of, of infantry. It's about the fact that this, uh, these pike squares, this, this actual columns, because they were advancing, they were advancing like, like that offensively, in fact, were aggressive. Were meant to, to be like, like a steamroller. Like whatever they found in themselves in the front, other infantry, cavalry, etc. At that point, as we were saying before, there was nobody who could have posed anything um, quite in the same way, right? Both for the speed and the uh, and the, the push of the same pikes that had been all trained to to have that kind of interaction, therefore maximizing the offensive capacity, uh, con concentrating that in in the front, right? Um, other infantry didn't didn't work like that, or at least didn't work in, with the same level, again, of, of, of collective coordination and concentration of force. Um, the Swiss didn't also always have the, this dramatic quality. For example, there was a very bad contingent raised by the Count of Gruyère that broke at the first shock at the Battle of Cherizol in 1544. So, again, uh, these are not uh, Uber mentioned. The, they are humans. Uh, armies are, again, there's nothing standardized about the, the, the quality of an army, right? Armies vary all the time in, in, in moral force, in level of training, in, in, uh, in organization, in array, in ground where they have to fight. So there is, uh, the, the beauty of military history is, of course, that there is no such thing like uh, a battle that is the same another or, or an army that is the same as another or fortunately there is no there is no human being that is equal to another on this earth there, there, there's never been and there never will and we should all thank god because of that and so every situation is different also the command the you know the, the circumstance the enemy is different right so um again there is no magic formula for winning all the time nor for thinking that you know a certain type of military organization is just superior a priori over any other kind of system or even systems that were defeated but statistically yes they were mostly defeated but sometimes they also kind of made it against the, the same system uh, the, the the positive one the victorious one so um, it is important to to look at that it's as if in, in, in the history of warfare even looking at this renaissance context when you see different nations that kind of all kind of compete with each other and there are various sort of one surpassing the other, etc. It's it's it, there were some sprints, some some leap forward, some some um, canalizations, let's say, of force that political and socially brought to to an army to prevail for a certain amount of generations, and then and then this force and the the preconditions for it kind of shrinks, or also because the enemy, also in relative terms, because powers around are changing and, and enlarging and becoming more aggressive. So it's normal to find such. Um, um, such changes, such, such evolutions or involutions for that matter. Um, and against enemy infantry, the Swiss nearly always took the offensive, right? Their training, as we've seen, gave them tremendous speed. Uh, they are going to charge artillery between the discharges, and they like to, to achieve surprise where possible, right? Uh, while the sight of that forest of spear points coming down that a rush was often enough for the enemy, right? So think about what this means. It's the speed, and consider that speed maintaining cohesion is a big deal. Again, that had never quite been done before in medieval warfare. Um, in in um, in again, the, the 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 psychological shock the enemy would have just seeing the mass, right? That that's intimidating, right? And the fact it was advancing. No matter what, right? There was there was some fanatic courage among the Swiss. Like, part of course of the, you know, the 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 rise of this nation has to do with the fact. Again, we were saying before that there was this kind of military virtue, this uh, kind of warrior culture that was channeled un under brutal discipline. It's something that we've seen historically in, in other peoples. It's a bit like the, what the Romans had done. It's basically combining the the rationality of order, authority, obedience, discipline, that it's the sap of, 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 of human superiority uh, and, the, 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 and the seed of civilization itself, with this brutal, uh, violent, uh, bloody capacity that 
However, as 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 harsh as it was, was also able to to recognize this superior order to to be framed within it, right? And so this obedience, this common goal, right? This 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 necessity of you know sticking together for for the for the common for the common benefit and what the the the, the country could could derive from it. So um, you need that moral force. You need that capacity of of somebody to. In fact, it, it's again it, all these individuals, not even with enough protection individually, but being aware that the mass, that the unity, made the difference, so that they could even charge against everybody, against anything, right? And the enemy couldn't quite put up enough mass to hold them most of the time, right? And the same principle for which you would advance against, you know, under under musketry fire or against a machine gun, because despite what people think war is from an incredibly narrow-minded individualistic perspective uh, actually substantiates in of course the sacrifice of the individual but to the benefit of, of, of the of the collectivity that operates on a, on a larger scale that of course the individual mostly doesn't see because it's not literate about military history enough to, to see that but it's exactly how you do things right and as Swiss pikemen would advance against anything right also meeting their death of course and meeting some point also somebody who would stand their ground against them right to uh to to win or die in the same way right and considered barignano the, the plain butchery just of this infantry that at some point paid uh, as we were saying before in the tactics of against the combined armed tactics as were being developed in the, in the renaissance with pike and shot and which shot right uh, you know think about the the you know what happens if you shoot a cannon into the Swiss, uh, like such a thickly compact formation. That's exactly what they were. They were pinned down, were is isolated, and simply massacred in that way, right? And why? Because again, they, they didn't have, they hadn't had the, enough mediation from the rest of, of the of the army, of the troops, of the allies, of, of the other arms properly, and. So how many times the Swiss would have uh, had already, uh, you know, exposed themselves to, to artillery? Again, uh, they they could do it because the conditions had had allowed them. When that factor becomes too systematic on the battlefield to kind of avoid it, to get it passed, or to, as we were saying, charging um, between a you know a shot and another, well, at that point you're going to pay brutally for it. And mono arms systems. Generally speaking, are not really, um, you know, very successful at this point because it, it's like the uh, a bit like the Flemish before. It could be an equation also with the Swiss instead. The Flemish are the the path openers. They are they are the ones in the, in, in the early 14th century as simple commoners that had not picked a weapon in their hands literally to to to, to, to the, the, in their lives that managed just because they're there to to again win or die against oppression that they stand their ground against the flower friend of, of, of European cavalry and exterminating it right uh, but what they, they were only infantry right but what did they achieve on the long run actually not much because from that victory onwards there was just a, a gradual decline a couple of battles where they they achieved you know minor minor kind of victory another kind of a tactical soul and then basically defeats for for the re the following only defeat. I mean, literally, and it's something impressive. Uh, up to for for the following two centuries, up to the Battle of Ginnegat, where they a had actually kind of imitated the, the Swiss model. At that point, it was also kind of a stall. Um, but it, the Swiss are a bit in the same in the same way. Right? They had achieved this moral superiority at the beginning, naturally in a much more mediated and kind of way than the the the, the Flemish. The Flemish were just some towns who decided to rebel. The Swiss now were an entire country, right? So this country manages to, to gain the initiative morally, right? The, the, to, to be driven in a way that nobody had quite had. Um, they, they concentrate that force to, to experiment this model. This model goes on for an important time, proportionally, but then eventually is overwhelmed by you know, other systems that are more refined with combined arms, kind of more, they're going past, right? Uh, combined tactics that, um, combined arms tactics that are, do not, you know, that were obviously to develop in, in that path. Where the Swiss tactic was, an organization was, after all, quite simple, 
right? It was difficult to achieve because, again, it required a lot of resources, a lot of training, it was costly. But it was very simple. It's just infantry advancing in a thickly compact fashion with, you know, being trained for using those weapons in, um, you know, in an effective way, maintaining the, the, the cohesion, uh, maintaining the, the front, uh, the, the, the line, uh, the head of formation intact during the advance and during attack. That's it. There's no, you know, deep uh, sophistication of their deep. Uh, but military culture is made by these things. It's a winning model. It's it's an it's an offensive model, driven by an extraordinary moral force. That's what the, the Swiss are, right? And that's how most warfare is, is literally meant. These even tactics are a mean to an end, right? And so they are not just born out of, of nothing or they are some kind of formula you can mathematically replicate just if you understand how they work. That's how most people look at history of warfare. That's not really it. That's not really it. Right? And that's also why war fundamentally is always the same. There is nothing that changes in it in general. It's always about the same things. The means are different, but it's how much you're driven that actually counts. Right? And that also, you know, certain general aspects of, you know, attack, defense, they're, they're kind of metaphysical, so that cannot really be uh, altered for that matter. Exactly because they, they lay in the physical world and they have specific effect consequences and so on. So the way these columns operate, as we've seen, there were different ways, uh, how many it could be, you know, the, the, I don't know. Uh, so most they were three normally. Uh, there could be two, like at Bicocca, there were f four thousand men each, and so on. So the idea is, however, that there were these columns, three most of the times, going forward in echelon, right? Uh, one, not always the right, as is also showed in you know most diagrams you find on the internet. It really depended, right? There was no r real standard thing. It was the fact of being three. Um, uh, Excellence. It reflects mostly what again the vanguard, the main body, and the rear guard, also in other armies, is, right? And and um, the, what was the point, right? The one would go in advance, right? The others further back to guard the flanks and especially act as a reserve, right? So they knew they could rely on this speed at the point that they could intervene. Um, in fact, in a uh, in not in a prearranged order, but let's say, exploiting uh, the uh, the tactical contingencies. This, this is to say, if you're speedy enough, you can also just remain there uh, in reserve, waiting to to catch the, the most profitable, situ advantageous situation to attack in a specific sector. Um, to And again, this thing was usually much less, um, you know, let's say, uh, the, 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 mm, I say was much more forced by contingencies than we think, right? But it still was an important way, also just to, you know, to test the enemy, uh, the enemy strength, because such speed that brought the entire army forward sometimes um, was was also risky for the same Swiss in a way, because if they 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 uh, the enemy might have not known about them, but very often fog of war they might have not known exactly what the enemy was so uh, having a, a vanguard that uh, opened the path and, and kind of you know communicated with the others to say okay we found them there right their forces are concentrated in this uh, uh, sector we see there are others etc was a way for for the other for the the elements of the army let, let's stress it they are infantry so they can't even run away right and if they break it's going to be a, a butchery because of of enemy, enemy cavalry can r really raise them um in in course of it um so it's very important to kind of a safety um uh, precaution uh to to also have such fresh reserves rather to intervene where it's more needed by in this dangerous situation right so the gradual fort here um, is very important uh, and you understand also that for enemies that mostly fought in line rather than in column this was also a an important thing because you, you had literally to to the, the idea of the Swiss here was breaking through a, a specific point right or uh, having mostly again this offensive capacity to to mm, blow the enemy 
uh, away just for the 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 surprise right the fact that they they were able to to spot the the weakest part of to to pop out uh, apparently of nowhere without uh without having been seen um and therefore you know on the enemy flank where at that point would make the enemy uh, formation collapse and so on but it was risky for them too right so uh, this didn't come without without risk without uh, some bet, some gamble in the same way. So always reflect on that and reflect in this sense how confident they were in doing this. And that's where you, you can see the moral superiority. Uh, because again, there is no way to make it. Even if you, you're aware, you to, to make it uh, you know, with certainty, even if you're aware of this advantage that you have, it's still, a, again, a risky situation. It, it's never a positively calculable advantage uh, for the sake of this is uh, you know for settling the matter in a determinate fashion you you don't know whether that's going to be enough it's not necessarily going to be decisive right and leadership also was relatively simple right um, surely it was professional rather than inspired this, this is important so they had um, experienced commanders who knew their deal who had also followed just the, all the training that knew the communities and so on so that were also involved and of course kind of loyal to, to the cause um, and the um, as we were saying before there was no Swiss um, entire adaptation to the growing power of firearms and field defenses right there was a essentially uh, of course from from the French they they learned the bloody lesson at Parignano uh, when they were decimated by by artillery um, and there was also the, the the disaster in the sunken road at Bicocca in, in 1522 and the, um, the but the command aspect is important because you see uh, these commanders were functional to this simplicity of, of, of the tactical forma, formula as well right um, they after these defeats of course the Swiss took a lower place they were still available part of a balanced force for for generations to come the, the Swiss would always serve kind of as mercenaries as you know in most if you think about the papacy the, 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 the kingdom of France Till very late in time, until today, in the case of, of the Vatican. But uh, literally, I mean, think about the French Revolution. All the, you know, also the rhetoric of these foreigners that, you know, as it was normal in, in most powers, you know, having a foreign guard means, you know, that it's more loyal to you because it's not really involved into the the national, the domestic affairs, and relies on you. Um, uh, and the there is also an important. Um, national cohesion of the Swiss armies as well. The Swiss bike squares were um, made up of the for so forces sent by a number of cantons, right? For example, at Barignano, the Nachhut came from Luzernebal, Schaffhausen, the Gewalthaufen from the uh, forest cantons, so-called Uri, Unterwalden, Schwitz, Zug, and the Grisons, and the Vorhut from Zurich, Appenstel, and Glarus, St. Gall, etc. Um, so these people, uh, especially in the in this important contingents that properly, in fact, represented the entire national effort um, in a or at least a substantial one, uh, were were all in the same boat in a way, right? Independently from the divisions, in fact, it would be triggered exactly by the, by these also by these defeats in the same Switzerland. Uh, they were literally all invested. In it. it was it was a, a sort of uh, as, uh, as always a sort of in of literally economical financial investment right a battle there was uh, you know a, a specific strategical involvement was calculated with uh, on the base of you know what, of the international situation of the profits they could make of the you know the, the sectors with their hand invested and so on and uh, it was important for a country like Switzerland to have also to have such kind of uh, you know of of, of um, management, let's say, because uh, again, uh, it's a myth that Switzerland cannot be invaded or conquered, right? So, uh, the the possibility of 
falling at a second uh, rank power and or you know having to 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 remain to, to lose initiative right it's, it's something that eventually historically would happen for the same switzerland to other powers right at some point they were out of the games because other powers were growing more more powerful more aggressive there was n not much they could do let's say swiss companies um were around 200 men strong right commanded by a captain the hauptmann uh standard bear the defender and um uh, the every every company was entitled to carry its own flag right so it was an important again sense of belonging probably of the communities that made up this these units that were literally you know the same neighbors the same people the, the same valleys the same towns the bi villages that they 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 lived in normally um such at aptitude to to war and to also foreign military uh, employment had made them you know functionalized like today you know think about today's swiss military culture the uh, you know the, the 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 military training that the properly the, the sense of properly of, of a national identity based on such uh all this po political religion based on the, the, the ability of defending right and properly considering your your military training as a as a as an integral part of who you are as a Swiss, right? This is this is what uh, was born then, and that actually was part of you know all of, of all of the world up at a certain time ago, right? You know, larger powers eventually kind of uh, d disarmed the populations, mediated more their armament, their training, because of course again they uh, they they needed to control much more directly and uh without such luxury of just being entrenched in a mountain and you know uh capitalizing upon all these this intervention I'd say uh, a more evolved and kind of mediated and controlled system that of course had to to keep things in order in different ways but um it's, it's worth mentioning because it, it's an example that that uh still you know, played an important role in, in, in many many communities for centuries to come, up to a, a, a relatively few few time ago, right? And we will talk more, especially about Middle European culture in this sense, from Clausewitz, Scharnhorst, and the idea of the citizen soldier, yes, but still with a kind of a warlike element that we don't find in, um, in the in the same ways combined in modern societies more than much. This is something that belonged a bit to the federal nature of, the, of Germany, of the same, of which the same Switzerland was part. And it is to be properly, it, it is probably also other countries, I mean, a bit common law countries are, are relatable in this, um, uh, are comparable in this, in this picture. But still there is um, something deeper in, in properly in, in in the cultural vision of war itself that is also uh at the root of such organizations but let's say that um the as we were saying before the command chain was quite simple right the um the swiss had few officers no ncos that's another interesting thing because if you look at the simplicity of the tactics uh, after all you understand that Yes, there was a few in terms of combined arms or of, of small unit tactics and kind of uh, lower kind of um, let's say uh, tactical awareness that had to be uh, you know in fact delegated to to sub of them. There wasn't something like that. Um, officers were elected to, so um, it's as if the 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 leadership was was chosen by the same. The same troops right because they would see which ones would would have the that simple and if you want pure capacity of leading in such uh in fact a direct way again they had just to advance so they needed have the guts properly to to stand in the front line with their own troops and and resisting to everything right it's this is to be seen later on also in the for example in, in the among the landsknechten Right, that we're still kind of German uh, brothers in in a, in a sense, and so this idea that even the nobility, think about the same Maximilian of Habsburg, but also later on some commanders like like the Frunsberg and so on, these were um, rough men standing 
in the front line with their men. Like there was something about that kind of moral force that was needed to support the simplicity of that tactics. Right? Surely was mediated was was you know uh, possible because of training of that intense training, but re required to, to the troops to be able again to withstand literally everything, and. An early 16th century battlefield is, is something that you really not want to witness in terms of, like any battlefield you would, really wouldn't uh, never think that you wouldn't be traumatized or shocked by what see what happens and say less than I don't know World War the first um, trench warfare situation because that's a grave misconception properly what happened on battlefields throughout you know even pre contemporary times um, you don't want to face a cavalry charge because that's one of the single most permanently traumatic events that you can ever experience and also like a uh, arquebus shot in itself and and properly also just marching against people that are going to kill you in hand to hand combat in that mass of spears in in a in, with a degree of violence that is is difficult and in a labyrinth think about the claustrophobia right of being you know in the front of 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 a of a hedgehog with you know these spikes you know, passing from everywhere, you're just in the middle and you're meat, right? Doesn't matter how armored you are in the front ranks, you're, you're just being pierced and killed. It, it's something horrifying, right? Maybe with a cannonball that smashes in front of you, you know, will you have limbs flying off, you know, it, 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 you, you, it, it's too much, right? I, I, pre, I presume that, uh, I, I want to be evil and say that, that also this great medicalization of, of the, the human condition and even the experience of traumas in 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 the second half of the se from from the second half of the of the 20th century acknowledge as such actually derived from a weakening of human uh of, of moral force right uh, these people were kind of habituated to a level of violence and properly of a, a, a habitude to death and suffering that today we don't understand anymore it's not that they were we are we are equal like there is no think biologically speaking that has changed from the 1500s to us we're exactly the same human beings we function exactly in the same way there's no difference of any sort so the capacities are completely the same it's the background of these people that was not even again these were not superheroes they were just mentally habituated to something else that today we have lost in a sense so it's not that again they wouldn't be shocked or traumatized but in a sense they were more habituated to the idea that that was somewhat a normal thing right whereas today the modern military may start having some some different attitude it's not that they're not tough or they're not prepared they're not professional they're not competent or they're not able to kill that that's what humans really do but it, it's the background from what they came from our own civilian life today our own culture our own softening Right, in twenty years, so much changed. Twenty years ago, you could see the world was the West was still that kind of warlike, tough in in the even exalted sense of itself in ways that today has completely lost in in a moral sense. Right, so think how what it could be half of a millennium ago, when war was just basically an in, a normal part of existence, because basically uh, every year there would be a war. Right, you would be involved in it in a way or another. If it, it didn't happen at your home, which would happen quite soon in a way or not in your lifetime, but it wouldn't uh, like it would involve you anyway because it was all around you, and you and like the Swiss, you would have even even be willing to participate in it as a as a as a as a job, essentially, and also something more because it was about their your own identity, your political participation, and so on. Um, another thing about the Swiss is that they were among the first troops to march in step to music, like they had their own drums, etc. Um, they in, in battle they charged to the quote frightening sound of their horns. Uh, they uh, the the sense again of belonging, the, the the idea that even the music, the we we all we dramatically overlook military music dramatically right there were some people who were kind of more uh between than others especially uh, islamic music had a great impact also in western one you know that basically most of the terminology of instruments from from modern military bands and also in the west they are all mostly dating to 
to the Turkish wars, right, to the, the war uh, taken from the Ottomans, because those were cultures in the Middle East and etc. Since the Parthians, the you know the Persian culture, the Iranians, etc., they were basically obs radically obsessed with the the idea that that the you know divine power passed through music. It was not just a Muslim thing. It was even the Khwarazmians had this. Uh, it was even Tacitus speaks about it for for the for the uh, for the Germans. It's the same Salian dance of the the, the Mars children in in Rome. I mean this um, idea that. That yes, it's the sound. Like in, even in the Indo-European culture, it's that the divine perfection is, is is also represented by the sound. But this great primordial sound uh, noise that comes from cosmic noise comes from the universe, that um, is um, is reflective of the, of divine power in, in reality. So um, that's an experience also during the Middle Ages exists. If you look, go look at you know medieval armies in west etc you, you realize that music there we haven't acknowledged it as a as a force because as westerners eventually in modern times we became rationalist we mostly again ob we are obsessed about technology um we think it's all about that and of course that's also because we have been de uh militarized exactly as we were saying before paradoxically uh, by our institutions um but um, to, uh, however, have our clamor of military power in that sense, but still having detached the individual from the, the awareness of that experience on a regular base. Um, so the Swiss use this for more practical reasons, of course, to maintain the step, because, again, the training required to maintain the, the pikemen in order, in a perfect geometric order, or more or less, at least, you know, enough to maintain cohesion, etc., and during the advances, it was fundamental, right? You had synchronized, right? So that's the obvious use. But still, there was so much value attached to this, right? The fact of having your own drums. The drum was a seen, was seen exactly as this prerogative, this prestigious element, right? Um, in um, the horns, the same ones they would call from, you know, the meeting the assemblies, uh, in the valleys, like William Tell, you know, uh, and that that was their own thing, was the, the thing of their own cantons, of their own community, right? And the flags as well. Uh, if you find it, you know, this beautiful, also the ones I used here uh, in the pictures of this beautiful representations of various flags of the uh, Swiss her heraldry, we'll talk about this at some point. But for example, the Uri Bull, right? The Unterwalden Cow. Right, these were particularly famous symbols. They probably being Auroch's horns, right? They were handed uh, that were used in fact for the for the same for the same call. They they um they were handed down rapidly from Charlemagne's day, because of course uh, that's all what most medieval mythology stemmed from. Uh Charlemagne was the was another constant essentially in the vision in the symbolism in the universe especially north of the alps and so um the they were soaked in this fanatic identitarism that however still made their own thing right it's important to be aware of your own past it's a, it, it, it's it's important to be aware of your own community it's, it's it's important to be aware of it right it's also important to be able to rationalize to understand to be able to put in perspective, to criticize, but it, at at some point you should use this knowledge to identify w in the sense who you are, right? Because a nation is this essentially. It's not just a random, um, absurd, let's say, combination factors for which you should do this thing. It's the recognition that you belong to a certain belief that there is a cohesion in that specific belief, right? And this may overlap with certain kind of more colorful elements of. Uh, of the local culture, even its homogeneity, it's important in a sense, but still it is about what you want to achieve and here the connection between politics and war and so this awareness also about the other, about the outer world, right, it's fundamental and the Swiss would have not achieved this if they hadn't um, if they hadn't acknowledged in fact their position in, in, in the Europe of the time now um there are other employment we again if if you look at that video I made about French infantry during the Italian wars, um you see the we talk a lot about the Swiss unavoidably because that's what most French infantry was technically. And um when in French service Swiss regimental organization developed, 
right into something more uh, in, in larger scale, let's say, um, this uh, naturally refractive other developments in you know early modern armies that go beyond the Swiss tradition. But for example, by by the 1600s, the Swiss units were of 10 or 12 companies now, each of 200 pikes, 30 muskets, and 30 arquebuses. Uh, so you see here still the pikes were kind of prevalent in an important fashion because at that point, um, uh, you know, other Western armies had reached kind of an equivalence more or less between pike and shot. Um, and or uh, here also the halberds were going to... To the, they, they were a thing throughout all the 16th century, but from the 17th they began notably to decline. The Swiss at that point had kind of remained uh, a bit behind, and they had not they were not the power they had been before, um, absolutely. But um, it's still remarkable that they fought in that way, so that they were still and they were still used as such, and would also in their own wars and their own events because uh, Swiss history is objectively complex, very complex, but um, and, and conflictual too. But that's exactly in a sense what made modern Switzerland and even beyond what had happened and paradoxically it's the after Marignano that made modern Switzerland and that's uh, it, in, it's important to see how even a defeat can provide the sap for a for a new civilization and for something that really has much more quality than anything. So as always, I would like to acquaint you to the graduality and the kind of relatively, uh, you know, the unpredictability, but still the, the positively intelligible way things happen historically. Uh, and uh, we will talk st about, about the Swiss uh, unavoidably, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, like we have to cover still the, like everything about most of medieval warfare we ha we haven't even began let's be honest right we have covered important things already but they're not even the beginning of all what we have to do um and we will make separate video about the swiss bodyguards uh for uh, the papal states and the the kingdom of france we'll talk about swiss um dress let's say at some point as well and the Swiss qualities, and in general, what Swiss warfare can be interpreted further like, and this is this is surely interesting. So, for today, we stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.